I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. Michael Lind, a professor at the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs. Dr. Lind has a Juris Doctorate from the University of Texas and a Master's Degree in International Relations from Yale, and has previously taught at Harvard and Johns Hopkins. Dr. Lin's experience includes work at the Center for the Study of Foreign Affairs at the U.S. State Department, and his writing has been featured in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, The Atlantic, Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, The International Economy, and The Financial Times. He's the author of more than a dozen books, including The New Class War and The American Way of Strategy. So, Michael, welcome. Today, we're discussing your article, American Grand Strategy, Disguising Decline, which was published in the National Interest, focused on the concern that America is in decline as a military power. So why don't I start out by asking you, what led you to write this article and what kind of public feedback have you had from it so far? Well, it was my contribution to a symposium of the National Interest, of which I was executive editor in my distant youth. Uh, on great power competition. Uh, and uh, what led me to emphasize the negative in, in the article, and, and I'm not, by no means negative about everything, was I think there's been a wave of triumphalism uh, since the Ukraine war began with the Russian invasion. Uh, there was an equally irrational wave of defeatism following the US extrication from Afghanistan. and uh, as a veteran of foreign policy for four decades, uh, I can tell you that the mood in Washington and in the country at large tends to be kind of bipolar. It swings from one extreme to another. Uh, so, so I may have overemphasized the, uh, the limits to American power, but we don't hear a whole lot about that at the moment. We have what I believe is a very misleading account of how the Ukraine war has proven that America is back right, that, you know, Russia is losing uh, and that the world is rallying behind us. Those are all, you know, uh, statements that need need to be qualified uh, at the very least. Uh, But in terms, there are two kinds of decline. There's relative decline and absolute decline. Uh, In absolute terms, the U.S. is richer than ever. Uh, Americans in general are healthier than ever before. We have better gizmos, better gadgets. Uh, Violent crime is at a historic low in spite of the recent uh, crime wave. Uh, What I was talking about in the article, because it's for the national interest, the foreign policy quarterly, is U.S. relative to crime. And I think it's important to distinguish between inevitable relative decline, which is simply a function of other countries becoming richer and more prosperous over time. Our share of world uh, of wealth and power will inevitably shrink, uh, particularly as big countries like China and India catch up. Uh, I think it's important to distinguish that from self-inflicted decline. Okay. We're going to have a certain amount of decline anyway, but there's some areas, and we can talk about that, where there's been just precipitous decline. And I think that's because of misguided policies. It's not because the rest of the world is catching up. Yeah. Well, so in the subheading of the article, you wrote the United States is in retreat, defeat or stalemate everywhere, whether in the military arena or in the realm of trade and industrial production. So I'm wondering, could you describe a few of the examples, the best examples that come to mind for that? Well, yeah, the best examples are in the military front. Uh, The Ukraine war is a stalemate. Uh, There is, in my opinion, not the slightest chance that the territory now occupied by Russian forces, uh, some of it will go back to Ukraine, perhaps. But Crimea is not. Uh, you know, much of the Donbass and, and a lot of these areas that Russia has occupied uh, will be under Russian control, unfortunately, uh, perhaps 50 or 100 years from now. Uh, you know, I think most rational people who are well informed will see this uh, Ukraine crisis ending in the partition of Ukraine. Uh, along, and it may not be considered legitimate, in which case we'll have a frozen conflict where international law does not recognize the legitimacy Mm -hmm. of claims to be Russian territory. Uh, But in that case, it simply joins Cyprus, divided between Greece and Turkey, 
uh, in Kashmir, divided between India and Pakistan, uh, Israel, Palestine, and so on, in frozen conflicts. So that's an example of a stalemate. Uh, and uh, if you look at defeats, we've had tactical successes, but strategic defeats. Yeah. Uh, every war we have fought, uh, beginning with uh, the invasion of Afghanistan after 9-11, uh, in, in 9-11, there wasn't even tactical success. We simply abandoned it. Uh, we fought for two decades against the Taliban, and then the Taliban came to power, and we left. Uh, uh, but in Iraq, yes, Saddam is gone. There's sort of a functioning parliamentary system. Uh, but you had the Iraqi parliament, as I point out in my article, uh, imposes the death penalty on anyone who will propose peace with Israel. I don't think that's what the Bush administration had in mind when it invaded. Uh, Syria, you can argue that we've defeated uh, Al-Qaeda and ISIS and, and some other jihadist groups, but Assad remains in power. Uh, Libya, which we invaded with our NATO allies, uh, we overthrew uh, uh, Gaddafi, but it is now disintegrated into three quasi-states run by warlords, uh, and when they're not completely anarchistic. So, if you look at these major military conflicts the U.S. has been engaged in since the end of the Cold War, really the, the uh, major success was in the Balkans, where the U.S. and its NATO allies ended the uh, wars of the Yugoslav succession and imposed a very stable system now. And, and you have democratic successor states, including in Serbia. But that's what I mean, I've been keeping count was that that's like one out of six conflicts that was not either a a failure or a stalemate. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, in the example of Afghanistan, I, I very well remember this photo of a Chinook hovering over the embassy roof in Afghanistan with Anthony Blinken's quote, this is not Saigon in the photo caption. And, you know, on the one hand, it didn't make us look good internationally. But a year later, it seems like Russia is getting egg on their face in Ukraine. So, I mean, would this be decline or, or just lack of planning, I guess? Well, Vietnam, the loss of Vietnam was a much more serious blow than the loss of Afghanistan because Vietnam, like Korea, and like the Afghan war during the Soviet invasion, uh, these were proxy wars uh, between great powers, between the U.S. and China uh, and uh, uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, so the stakes were much higher. Uh, and uh, following the U.S. Uh, retreat from uh, Indochina, that did embolden the Soviet Union. And we had what was called the Second Cold War. Mm -hmm. the, the U.S. is weak. They rapidly built up and modernized their armed forces. Uh, and we were really rescued by the IT revolution. Uh, because uh, uh, during war between uh, Syria and uh, uh, Israel in the Bekaa Valley, uh, the Soviets observed that the new American uh, com uh, computer-guided uh, missiles were far superior to theirs. Uh, and so the uh, KGB, and uh, which was essentially running the Soviet Union at that point, un under Andropov and his, his handpicked successor, Gorbachev, who was not KGB, but, but was backed by them, they realized how weak the Soviet Union was. And so they wanted a timeout to catch up in terms of uh, uh, the digital revolution. Oh, okay. And by contrast, I think it is, I'm, we were right to get out of Afghanistan. We should have done it 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, now, the way we bugged out was humiliating, and we paid a price for that. But the price of bugging out is less than the price of staying in. Uh, so I see it as, as a good move. It was similar to uh, Charles de Gaulle uh, uh, liquidating the French war and rule over uh, Algeria. It, it actually made us stronger. Uh, so in, in the case of Russia, it has backfired at least temporarily against uh, uh, Putin uh, because it seems likely he thought this would be a sort of blitzkrieg. It would be a very quick uh, operation. And then uh, uh, he could impose his terms on, on Ukraine and, and uh, its support. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and that backfired. Uh, but nevertheless, we have to be careful. There are many cases in uh, history in which uh, wars that are bungled initially by the aggressor uh, take a turn later on because uh, the, the incompetent generals get replaced. Uh, and, and 
This was true in our own civil war, right? The first few years, you, you had some inferior uh, generals like the McClellan. And finally, uh, Lincoln you know, found Grant, uh, Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, you know, somebody who could really uh, uh, wage the war the way it should be waged. So I think, you know, at this point, before the, this winter, in which uh, much of Europe will be suffering terribly from the cutoff of Russian uh, natural gas, uh, in which you will unfortunately probably have famines in some countries because of the yeah. interruption of Ukrainian and Russian grain, uh, it's by no means clear uh, that... that uh, the, the, the will of Americans and Europeans will last uh, out, out, out to a point that the Russian will breaks. Uh, uh. It's a great uh, German uh, military theorist. Uh, you know, he, he said that uh, in the case of morale, you can target your enemy's ability to wage war or your enemy's willingness to wage war. And the m- morale and willingness are particularly important when there is an asymmetry of interest between the two parties. So in the case of Russia, Putin sees this as an existential battle. He's made this clear. It's almost messianic, right? This is the fate of mother Russia is at stake, uh, not just as a great power, but even as a society, uh, gathering in these former Russian lands. I mean, this may be crazy, but this is what he thinks. Obviously for the Ukrainians, it's the survival of their country intact, you know, in, in the form they want it. Uh, it sadly, uh, perhaps, uh, you in uh, uh, Western Europe and the U.S. do not have that kind of existential stake uh, in the outcome in Ukraine, and and so that weakens us vis-a-vis Russia. Even though materially, the U.S. and uh, Europe combined just dwarf, you know, Russia's. Uh, uh, material power. Uh, okay. Well, let me let me connect this back to again the the military decline in our own forces that you talked about in the article. So this year, military.com published data indicating that seventy seven percent of American youth are unfit to serve due to being overweight. And CNBC says that the U.S. Army fell short of its 2022 recruitment goals by 25 percent because it's simply becoming harder to find qualified recruits. So I was wondering, as you were talking about decline in the U.S. military, do you think that's a reflection of larger scale social decline in American culture? No, I I don't. There, There is social decline. And in the intermediary link between social decline and military decline is, is the structure of our economy. And we can get into that. But, but I don't see having a cannon fodder in terms of fit young men and perhaps fit young women uh, is, is going to play much of a role uh, in, the, in the military in the future. Uh, uh, you can have a morbidly obese person operating drones from 2,000 miles away uh, and being more effective, uh, you know, than, than some fit, uh, former football player uh, kicking down doors. I just do not see us, particularly after these failed low-level wars in the Middle East and North Africa. I don't see another American president in the next generation sending large numbers of U.S. troops as occupying forces uh, into third world societies. It's just, I, th- I think there will be a post 9-11, post Afghanistan backlash. Yeah. It was the so-called Vietnam syndrome. Uh, so what does concern me uh, is on the technological front. Uh, so uh, the, we developed, we didn't invent, uh, there are various countries invented it, but we developed drone technology in this country. Uh, 54% of uh, drones, the civilian drones sold worldwide uh, are sold by one Chinese company, uh, DJI. They supply somewhere like 80 or 90% of all of the civilian drones being bought and sold and not used in the United States, including by law enforcement uh, at the state and local level. Uh, that is much more concerning to me than the fitness of draftees, you know, and the, and the possibility of a draft. Uh, uh, Japan, it's not just China. Uh, Japan is about a third of the size of the United States population. 
it builds 47% of the world's robots. Uh, we're hardly represented. Uh, machine tools. Uh, machine tools are tools that make other machines, like lathes, for example, you know, cutting tools for factories. Uh, and, and robots are machine tools as well. Uh, China dominates the machine tool market, followed by Japan and Germany. U.S. has just basically collapsed. And, and you, you go down the list, uh, thanks to the Defense Department, uh, Boeing uh, is kind of a national champion in the U.S. Wide-body jetliners are still dominated by Boeing and by Airbus. Uh, we have a lead in high-end medical uh, innovation. Uh, but we can't man manufacture it. We've lost the ability in the United States to manufacture even penicillin. Uh, according to one estimate, 80% of advanced pharmaceutical ingredients, these are the chemicals you, that you make drugs from, uh, come uh, mostly from China and India. And the reason for all of this is the same. Uh, it's cheap labor. It's, it's low wages. Uh, that is, uh, uh, it, some of us warned back in the 80s and 90s, there were a number of us, that if you merge a high-wage economy with a low-wage economy, be it Mexico or you know, Vietnam or China or Thailand or whatever, Philippines, then uh, it makes sense for your manufacturers to shut down their production in your high-wage economy, open up factories in the low-wage economy, and then ship the goods back. Yeah. And, and this is what has been done. And they call it globalization, but globalization is whatever states make of it. I mean, it's shaped by treaties uh, and by laws, and you can have any different, various kinds of globalization. Well, it, it seems like this goes back to a policy of appeasement that you talked about in the article for rising powers like China, where the U.S. is taking a harder stance with weaker adversaries like Serbia, Iraq, Syria, Libya, and Afghanistan. Could you elaborate, could you elaborate a little bit on those for us? Yeah, I, I think there was a feeling, beginning with Bill Clinton, uh, the, the, initially George W. Bush was very focused on China. There were real ten tensions with China militarily. And it looked like we were moving towards, and then you had 9 11 war. And so we kind of got distracted in, in chasing jihadists in, in, the, in the Middle East and Central Asia. Uh, but, you know, I mean, I've, I've heard people in foreign policy say this like, there's no way we can defeat China. You know, these are, yeah. you know, including commercial, particularly in commerce, not the Pentagon so much. But, but the view of a lot of capitalists in the U.S. and CEOs and investors is, well, A, they're too big. I mean, we'll lose if we fight them. Uh, B, if we don't access their market, then uh, uh, you know, the Germans and the Japanese and various other export-oriented countries will, and we'll lose global market share. Uh, and so I, I think if you combine that with the idea that uh, – we can't simply be one of a number of great powers. We have to be number one. Then you can have what uh, uh, has been called a, a theatrical micro-militarism, right? Lots of explosion. You, you know, you, you knock over these weak, corrupt, technologically laggard regimes like uh, Milosevic in Serbia and Saddam in, in Iraq. Uh, and this look, oh, we're so powerful. We're the greatest power since Rome while you, you send these kind of groveling business delegations to Beijing. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I think it's a mistake, but on the other hand, it's not, an, it's not irrational, right? It's not irrational. Well, it, it, is, it is interesting. Like in, now in the case of Russia, they're a threat because they have nuclear weapons. But China seems like a giant dilemma because we do rely on them so heavily for manufacturing. And one of the things that I've been wondering about is, should we be partnered so closely with a country that's aiming nuclear weapons at us? And, and then there's another part of me that's wondering, you know, maybe they should be asking the same question about us. Well, that leads to... What do you think uh, a, a world in which the U.S. is no longer the overwhelming economic power and military power would look like? And we really, nobody's really thought about this since Franklin Roosevelt, frankly, uh, because the Cold War came along in, under Harry Truman and then lasted until the 90s. Uh, and then following that, there was this period, which is now ending in my opinion, of the unipolar world, right? We're number one and 
We're just going to dominate the world forever. If you go back to FDR during World War II, and there was conversations with uh, Churchill that we know about. He did not intend the U.S. hegemony over the world. He assumed the British Empire would continue to be powerful. The Soviet Union would be, you know, very powerful. He didn't think they would take over half of Europe, but, you know, uh, this was going to be a force after the war. Uh, he even thought Chiang Kai-shek, not Mao, Mao was not yet in power, but Chiang mm-hmm. Kai-shek, you know, would be a major power uh, in, in East Asia and the Pacific uh, once Japan was defeated. So he had this idea of the four policemen, as he called them, uh, the U.S., the British, and this is the British Empire, not the British Islands. Yeah, yeah. Or British Commonwealth, you know, if it was disguised as being democratic, uh, the Soviet Union, another empire, and uh, uh, China, under some sort of management, would be the dominant powers. And uh, it would be kind of a 19th century concert of power, right, where, you know, they get together at, at international meetings and summits, and they, and they work out global uh, problems. Uh, and to my mind, this is really the last time American leaders thought in those terms, although interestingly enough, uh, like you, I grew up watching like these old, you know, movies and science fiction stories and, and TV shows and so on in the 60s and 70s. Uh, and they always had the United Nations meeting. Yeah, yeah, that was... That, with with that Dr. Was... Evil or whatever, the Joker. And uh, so it actually was kind of a picture that the U.S. was the chairman of the board, but was not the mafia boss, right? You know, that there are these other countries and they have their cultural costumes. yeah discussing these things. Uh, I think we got drunk with power uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, and we misinterpreted temporary weakness of Russia and also China, because several, and and also Japan and Germany, frankly. Uh, So let's go back to the 90s, because that's the root of a lot of our problems. Mm, Okay. So uh, the Soviet Union uh, disintegrates, which nobody expected. Uh, remember, in I think it was 1992, uh, President George W. Bush flew to uh, Kiev and told the Ukrainians, do not secede from the USSR, right? Or, no, this was 1990, maybe. Uh, it was before the, the breakup of the Soviet Union, because he and Jim Baker and Scowcroft thought that would be destabilizing. So we had the President of the United States telling the Ukrainians, stay in an association with the Russian. They wanted the USSR to stick together as a non-communist kind of, you know, trading block entity, uh, nobody foresaw that it would actually disintegrate uh, in, in the aftermath of, of the coup. Uh, uh, at the same time, China was uh, really weak because it was undergoing this transition from one great helmsman, uh, Mao Zedong, to the new great helmsman, uh, uh, Xi Jinping, Right. So it had kind of weak collegial government it was shifting. its, So, you know, it, it didn't seem terribly threatening. Uh, Japan uh, had a real estate bubble that collapsed and uh, there was a decade of low growth. It's the same thing that happened to us in 2008. But the triumphalists in Washington, D.C., and I was in Washington at the time uh, witnessing all this. They said, oh, this proves that Japanese industrial policy is a failure. Uh, it's a failure. It's just they had a real estate at first. Uh, and at the same time, Germany was paying a very high price in slow growth and mass unemployment in the 90s because of absorbing East Germany at yeah. great expense to West Germany. So, so the U.S., you know, is basically like everybody else got struck by the flu. Uh, and we said, oh, look, our genes are superior, right? Uh, and then if, if we'd waited until 2008, we came down with the Japanese flu. The, the popping real estate model, right? You know, we came down with what the Soviets had experienced in Afghanistan. is the same country, Afghanistan, right? They bugged out and we bugged, uh, de- defeated in both cases by similar forces. Uh, so, so I think the root of a lot of our problems come from this hubristic uh, triumphalism and overreach uh, in the 1990s. Uh, and and it wasn't just greed on the part of corporations. I mean, there were people in Washington, in the Clinton administration, in the, the Bush administration. They really believed that uh, 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 economic interdependence 
would uh, lead to the growth of, of pro-democratic forces in China. Uh, and those pro-democratic forces would be uh, uh, anti-military and anti-nationalistic. Now, I was skeptical the whole time. I just simply, I'm a realist and, and, and a kind of historian by background. Uh, in some countries, as the middle class gets richer, they become more democratic. But in some countries, they become anti-democratic because the uh, newly developing bourgeoisie is terrified that the working class below it, you know, will take over uh, and they side with uh, uh, dictators. Historically, as countries develop, middle classes uh, tend to become more ambitious and more nationalistic. Uh, and the reason is they have the leisure to do so. So when Germany was a bunch of peasants being trampled by Swedish and Russian and French armies in the 16th, 17th century, they didn't spend a whole lot of time dreaming of German world domination, right? Once they become the richest uh, country in Europe, then they start, the, and again, it's not the poor German workers and, and farmers, it's the educated bourgeoisie. They start asking, why does Britain get to have a global empire and not Germany? And why does France get to have Polynesia and we don't have any Pacific Islands? Uh, so, so I just think it was a mistake. Uh, and it was kind of an innocent mistake. It was a mistake of the head. Yeah. Of the heart. It, it, that, that, it, that does make sense. Well, it, it, now, in terms of this rising power, and again, I'm, I'm thinking back to China. Uh, back in October, uh, a Senate GOP report on COVID origins indicated that a lab leak in China was most likely. Um, so despite global socioeconomic disruption and over 6.6 million deaths from the COVID virus, it doesn't appear that the U.S. or its allies are attempting to hold China to any kind of accountability. So I, I'm wondering, is this part, do you think, of a policy of appeasement because we're so economically dependent on them? Yeah, I think that's the only way to explain it. In the case of uh, COVID, uh, the U.S. and National Institutes of Health and the CDC were involved in this program with China, which just seems really bizarre. And we, I don't think we learned all exactly what was going on there, but I think there's embarrassment for the U.S. as well as the Chinese. Yeah. That, that's why, you know, uh, inquiries into the possible lab origins was discouraged both by China and the U.S. Uh, but uh, well, just let, let me put it this way. So, Having this deep integration with China since about 2000 has led to at least three global disasters. By, for no fault of the Chinese, it's, it's a structural thing. So the first one came from uh, Chinese exports, uh, manufactured exports flooding global markets. Uh, and these Chinese markets uh, uh, exports were subsidized in various ways. It wasn't just cheap labor. Hmm. Uh, okay. On global markets. And they wiped out uh, much of the U.S. Midwest, much of the manufacturing, much of the uh, British Midlands, uh, much of the German Ruhr and, and the industrial parts of Italy and France. And if you look at the, the epicenters of populism uh, in, in the Western world, it's these areas that suffered from what a David Autor and his colleagues called the China shock uh, uh, between 2000 and 2010. Uh, and this is just as true in Germany and France and Italy as it is in Britain, uh, the northern industrial Midlands, uh, and in the Midwest, you know, Trump country. Uh, so, so that was the first big shockwave coming out of China. Uh, the second was the, the global financial crisis indirectly was related to China because China by, it, it, it had this, they gave, they gave it up, but during the 2000s, uh, they deliberately undervalued their currency by a process of financial sterilization. Uh, so they were getting all these dollars from the U.S. By, because of their surplus. Uh, rather than spending them in the global market or buying things from the U.S., which would have made their currency, the yuan, rise, they sterilized it by having their central bank just buy them and hide them, basically, mm. so that, and keeping the dollars. So that kept the dollar high and the yuan or the renminbi low to the benefit of Chinese exports. So it was a kind of industrial policy. The problem with that was uh, it allowed this uh, 
really 20 year period of unnaturally low interest rates. Uh, because, you know, basically, you know, no matter how low the interest rate, like the central bank of China is going to buy these bonds to sterilize the dollars, right? Uh, and that led to gambling and asset bubbles in real estate and stocks. Uh, and so you had this big buildup of private uh, uh, in debt as well, uh, because interest rates were so low. And again, this was in, indirectly related to US-China trade. And, and the buildup of private debt led to the Great Crash, followed by the Great Recession in 2008. So then the global pandemic, uh, which is a, is a result perhaps of US-Chinese medical collapse, that's kind of like the last. So, so how many global disasters do we have to undergo before we say, maybe there's something wrong with having merged these economies. And I'm not blaming the Chinese. Uh, the United States destabilized the world in, in the late 19th, early 20th centuries uh, by dumping vast amounts of wheat on world markets from the Great Plains. Uh, what happened was in the late 19th century, uh, the development of railroads uh, in, into the U.S. interior allowed the Midwest to export enormous volumes of, to mm -hmm. the world. At the same time, railroadization in Argentina and in Ukraine, which was important then, and, and Poland and Eastern Europe. Uh, so there was a glut. Everybody was dumping their grain on the world market. So prices fell. There was the Great Depression of the, uh, the original Great Depression in the 1870s, to 1890s. Peasant farmers in Poland wiped out, William Jennings Bryan's agrarian populist farmers wiped out, uh, and it created all kinds of social turmoil and upheaval. Uh, and in Europe, it often took anti-Semitic and uh, you know, far-right nationalist forms, blaming the Jews, right, for, for the collapse of uh, farmers' incomes when it was really the American flooded global grain market. Okay, okay. So we, you know, it was inevitable that, uh, and, and now India uh, has already, I, I believe this year, surpassed China in population. Uh, and it's, it's coming from a much lower per capita base, but it's getting richer over time. That's going to have all kinds of effects. It's just like a new planet appears in your solar system, and the gravity has this effect. And, and for some reason, nobody in Washington was thinking about this. They were just thinking, oh, well, just deregulate markets, and the market will stabilize everything. Yeah, well, it seems like I've been hearing about this this idea of decoupling from China economically, and that's something that kind of came into vogue, I think, two or three years ago. It had been talked about before that, but it's it seems like it's been taken more seriously. Do you know if de decoupling is still happening, and does it put us in a stronger position in terms of international policy to to maybe pull these economies apart a little bit so that we're not so intertwined? Well, the Biden administration, there was a question when, when Biden was inaugurated, would he go back to this kind of, you know, pro-liberalization, you could call it appeasement policy of China, economically or not? They have really doubled down. I mean, they've gone beyond Trump in many ways in, in terms of export controls, the Chips and Science Act, the subsidies. Now, these are still far short of what real decoupling would require. Uh, but I do think we're locked at this point into uh, Cold War II. Uh, yeah. I've, I've written, yeah, I wrote in 2008, I think this is the beginning of Cold War II, when uh, uh, China shot down its own satellites in, in orbit and created a huge ring of debris. And that was literally a warning shot to the US, right? You know, that we cannot be on all your satellites. Well, and there is a shift that's underway from this period of desert warfare back to this great powers competition, which is focused on China and Russia. Um, now, do you think this is because conflict is coming or is this a redistribution and changing focus as a way to prevent conflict? Well, I'm, I'm a classical realist, as they say, in international relations theory. Uh, you know, there's what is called the security dilemma. Uh, since there's no global government, uh, it's kind of like the Wild West. You have to defend yourself. Yeah. And even if you're friendly with your neighbor and you see your neighbor stockpiling all these weapons, then you think, well, why? And then you ask your neighbor, yeah. right? 
like, who are you stockpiling the weapons against? You're like, oh, yeah, who knows what could happen? I could be attacked. Like, but we're the only people in the neighborhood, right? So, and, and but uh, there's a profound perception there. That is, it doesn't really matter what the nature of the regime is. This is obviously resisted by many people. I mean, it's one theory of how the world works. But if, if the only two countries in the world tomorrow were the U.S. and our friends, the British, you know, the British would have to start thinking, okay, well, we were allies against common enemies with the Americans. Uh, from, we were enemies before that uh, in the first half of the 19th century. And the basic question under security uh, dilemma theory is, do you prepare, do, do you assess a, a rival's potential capabilities or their motivations? Mm, okay. Right? So what is called liberal peace theory, a democratic peace theory, say, oh, it's their motivations. All right. So if China has twice the, the economy of the U.S. And, and they have twice the military and they have submarines in the Gulf of Mexico and they have troops in, you know, Tijuana, you know, on the Mexican border. As long as they're a multi-party democracy, we don't have anything to worry about, right? And the realist answer to that is, well, maybe not now, but what happens if they become an anti-American dictatorship tomorrow? You have to look at their actual capabilities. Yeah. So it's kind of a paranoid view of the world, but you know, I think it's borne out by history because there's no global government. Uh, and attempts like the United Nations and the League of Nations to create a kind of higher court of last, it just hasn't worked. It's, it's a world of self-help. So you have to worry not just about your current rivals, but about your current allies. And what are their capabilities compared to ours? And this is relative capabilities, okay? It's, it's relative power that counts, not absolute. So the Netherlands was a great power in the 17th century. I mean, they had colonies in Brazil, they fought wars with Britain. They were a leading industrial power. Uh, uh, the, the Dutch today are vastly richer than the Dutch in the 18th century. But they're vastly smaller than Britain, and they're vastly you know, smaller, and Britain is smaller than the U.S. and China. So scale counts, right? It's not simply how advanced you are, but you have to have mass. You have to have quantity. Yeah, yeah. Well, Michael, thank you so much for your time today. Let me close by asking, what comes next for you in terms of your writing and your work? And what do you expect to see in America's future as a country over the next few years? Well, that's an hour long uh, interview in itself. But well, I, you know, I may, I, may, I may have you oh. back for that one. If, if you're open well, to I'll, that. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll be uh, pleased to. Uh, in uh, May... Penguin is publishing my next book, Hell to Pay, about how low wages and bad jobs are uh, undermining uh, American society in all kinds of ways, uh, uh, from growing class division to failed family formation and so on, and, and uh, actually technological stagnation. So, so that should be somewhat controversial. Uh, in terms of the U.S., uh, my analysis that I set forth in my most recent book, new class war remains. Uh, I think there's a real danger that we're moving from a left-right paradigm to an insider-outsider paradigm of the kind that is familiar from Latin American countries, mm. where you have a very rich oligarchy and periodically you get some populists rebel against it. It's true of the American South between the Civil War and the Civil Rights Revolution. You had that same dynamic. And, and it's really bad because you don't want to live in a society where you have the elites in the gated communities uh, fighting with populist demagogues who, for the most part, are charlatans and frauds and blowhards. I won't name names, but some might come to mind. Uh, so so that's, that's kind of my pessimistic vision of, of where we will end up unless we you know, really think in, uh, seriously and intelligently about you know, the situation both at home and in the Absolutely. Michael, thank you again so much, sir. Thank you.